Hello world, it's Austin. Let's talk about being transgender and Christian. So last week I introduced you to the eunuchs of the Old Testament, and if you missed that video, I would highly recommend going back and watching it because it will answer important questions like, why are we talking about eunuchs? This week I'm going to be talking about the eunuchs that we meet in the New Testament, specifically in Matthew 19 and Acts 8. I know some of you have probably been thinking, okay, enough already with the Old Testament, let's get to the Jesus stuff. So today we're getting to the Jesus stuff. In fact, we're going to talk about one of the most confounding passages in the New Testament. Here's Matthew 19, verses 11 and 12. Jesus said to them, Not everyone can accept this teaching, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept this who can. I had so many questions the first time I heard these verses. Is Jesus being metaphorical here, or is he talking about literal eunuchs? And when he says kingdom of heaven, does he mean the heaven with like the clouds and the pearly gates and the angels and the harps, or does he mean like God's kingdom on earth? You never know with Jesus. It could be metaphor, it could be literal, we just don't know. And honestly, with a passage like this, there's no way to get a straight answer. People have been puzzling over this stuff for hundreds and thousands of years before us, and will probably still be doing it hundreds and thousands of years after us. All we can do is pray for some wisdom and some understanding and try to look at the possibilities. Here's the first possibility. Jesus wasn't actually talking about eunuchs who have been physically castrated. He was possibly talking about people who have been called to celibacy. This passage falls right at the end of Jesus' teaching about divorce in Matthew, in which he says that divorce just shouldn't happen, and that's a whole different conversation for another time. The disciples react to this by saying, hey, if I get married and I'm miserable and I can't get out of it, then it's better to just be married at all. Maybe marriage is a bad thing. And this is when Jesus says, not everybody can accept this teaching, but... So maybe Jesus is using eunuchs as a metaphor here for people that have chosen not to get married or have chosen a celibate lifestyle. Those who are considered eunuchs from birth could include people who are asexual, and those who choose to be eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven could include monks and nuns and priests and other people that are celibate in order to follow God's calling for their lives. But what about that line about being made eunuchs by others? It's pretty unlikely that Jesus thought there was a whole group of people who were forced into lifelong celibacy. That's part of the reason that I subscribe to a second reading of this text. I think Jesus was talking about real, literal eunuchs, people that were in the middle of this binary, who kind of moved back and forth in social circles, and who were unable to create biological families of their own. In a way, Jesus took on a lot of similar roles in society. In fact, he said that the people who were his mother and brothers weren't the people that were biologically related to him, but the people who did the work of his father God. And when we look at this passage in the literal sense, we can see Jesus talking to all of us as people with different gender identities. There are those of us who have been different from birth, like those of us that are born intersex. There are those of us that are changed, whether physically or mentally, by others. And there are those of us who choose to change our own bodies in order to live more fully into the life God has called us to lead. The other passage I want to touch on is more straightforward. You can find it in Acts 8, verses 26 through 39. In this text, Philip, who's one of Jesus' disciples, is told by an angel to go out to a wilderness road in the middle of the day. Philip does it, though probably not without saying, seriously, dude, it's like 100 degrees out there. Anyway, Philip goes, and he meets an Ethiopian eunuch coming along the road from Jerusalem. This eunuch is a really high-ranking person in the uh, Ethiopian queen's court, and he's riding along in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the same book we were talking about last week. So the eunuch is reading part of Isaiah that includes a prophecy that early Christians believed was directly about Jesus. So Philip kind of goes, hey, you want help reading into that? And the eunuch goes, yeah, of course, climb aboard. And so they go on in this chariot together, reading Isaiah and talking about the life of Jesus. And Philip tells the eunuch everything about Jesus' life and death and resurrection. So put yourself in this eunuch's shoes for a minute. You are called somehow by these holy texts that are not from your people. You're Ethiopian and there's no mention that you have any connection to Israel. You're just really interested in these texts. And so the obvious thing to do is to go to Jerusalem, Israel's holy city, and try to find out more, right? But then imagine you actually get to Jerusalem and they say, hey, you're not an Israelite and also you're a eunuch. You can't come into the temple. And you kind of think, oh, but okay, but it says in Isaiah. And they're like, well, that's a really great passage and all, but we haven't actually put any of that into a effect. So, sorry. I'd be pretty heartbroken to have traveled so far only to be turned back. I would have felt pretty crushed. And so it's kind of amazing that he's coming back from Jerusalem reading these texts. Now, we don't know if that's the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. We don't know if he actually went to Jerusalem to try to find this stuff out. But given the fact that he's reading these texts, he's not an Israelite, and he's coming from Jerusalem, we can kind of put some pieces together. What we do know is that when the Ethiopian eunuch met Philip and started reading these texts with him, he was overjoyed. 
verses 36 through 39 say, As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, but went on his way rejoicing. So there you have it. The eunuch himself asks, is there anything, my sex, my gender, my status, my ethnicity, is there anything that should keep me from becoming part of the body of Christ and part of the family of Christ now that I understand and believe? And frankly, Philip doesn't even have to answer him because it's not any human's responsibility to stand in the way of what God wants to do in people. Once God calls you, you're called, and there's not much anybody else can do about it. So don't let any human ideas about who's in or who's out stop you. If God is calling you as a beloved child to be part of God's kingdom in the world, then you're called, whether you're gay or bi or trans or asexual or intersex or anything else. You're called, and I hope you feel it, and I hope you feel like you can respond. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you liked it, please hit subscribe, and I will see you next week. Peace.